Rolling Stone put out an article. Uh, it was something like NBA's anti-vaxxer problem and they're pushing around the league and all that stuff. And I had a call with a journalist and it was all good faith. Oh, you know, Jonathan, you know, would love to get your story, all this stuff. And I'm telling him about, you know, why my decision not to get vaccinated. Yeah. And then the article comes out and it's like Jonathan Isaac waited for people to die. He put his trust in God, all this different stuff. I'm like, this is terrible. And I was furious because this, this is the first time that I had saw that there there is a media bias and a, uh, you know, people call it propaganda. People call it um you know, they, if they want something to go in a certain way, they have the power and the tools to do so. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to their discretion. And so that was my first instance of being like, they're right. Yeah. <laughs> People are telling the truth about all this stuff. I'm Dave Rubin. We're here at Locals in Miami. And joining me is a forward for the Orlando Magic, author of the book Why I Stand, and founder of the new clothing company Unitas, Jonathan Isaac. Welcome back to the Rubin Report. Thank you for having me, man. Glad to be here. I have to say, you're the first person we ever had to move a table for and actually change some of the uh, situation that we have going here. People want to know, most importantly, 610? 611. 611. Really, really like seven something with the Six. hair, but I'll be, I'll be modest. <laughs> does the hair count on rebounding? No, it doesn't. It, do, it, it does doesn't. not. Uh, it's good to see you again. We've done a couple sit downs over the years. Uh, obviously, NBA player, author, as I said, launching a new brand. Uh, just quick for the people that, that don't know you, give me a little of the, the Jonathan Isaac story getting you to the NBA, and then we'll get into the new stuff. Of, of getting to the NBA? Yeah, g- give me the, the life story uh, that gets you to the NBA, and then we'll get to okay, what so you're doing these super days. Super quick. Like you yeah. said, name Jonathan Isaac. I grew up in Bronx, New York, till I was about 10. Played a little bit of basketball there, but not, it wasn't like my thing. Moved to Naples, Florida, started to play a little bit of organized basketball. Um, fell in love with it, kind of put everything into it. Became the number one player in the state of Florida. Um, went to Florida State University. I went to IMG for a year before that. IMG Academy, Florida State University, and then was drafted six pick to the uh, Orlando Magic back in 2017. And so now you've been in the NBA, that's what, six, six seasons? Six seasons. Six seasons. Uh, a couple injuries along couple the way. Injuries, yes. But you're, you're healthy now. You finished the season. I'm ready to rock. You're ready to rock. Ready so this will be really like your first season in a couple of years, this upcoming first, season. First full season, yes. I got to play a little bit this, this, this past season coming back. You know, it was, it was a big deal. Um, we're missing a lot of time. But uh, this is my first summer of being actually able to work out and not just be rehabbing. So it feels good to actually get in the gym and work out and, and looking forward to this upcoming season. How does it feel to be out as long as you were out and the ups and downs of surgery and all that stuff? And you know, I have a, I have a torn ACL right now. So out of oh, four knees here, you, you have the two good ones, ironically, um, at least mostly good, I guess. Um, but like just mentally to like get back on the court after all that time and everything, how does that feel? It's tough. It's tough. It's, uh, uh, it's terrible, honestly. Like, like Going through it, you know, you have, it's not just like you going through an injury kind of by yourself. You have, you're dealing with it. You have the fans are dealing with it. Yeah. The, the organization is dealing with it. You know, fans, you know, when are you going to come back and play? Why aren't you playing? Um, so it's not something that's easy to do. Um, and I know for a fact that I wouldn't be able to kind of press my way through it if it wasn't for one, my faith. Um, and then the people that I have around me, my wife, my family, my pastor, my church family. Um, people to just encourage me and help me to see the good in every single situation that I'm going through. Um, and that has me here. And also, you know, I think the last point of that is just being able to identify with other people who get injured now. Like I have a, I have a new, I guess, like perspective on injury and, and how much grit and grind it takes and how you do get to see who you are when you're faced with that kind of adversity as an athlete. What, what about the mental part when you get back on the court? Like your doc says, okay, your knee's fine, right. and you're like, your body feels good, but, because I can tell you, and I'm no NBA player, but just from playing with a weak knee, like it's more mental that I'm always worried about when I'm running around out there than the physical part in a way. Honestly, it's, it's like riding a bike. Um, I, I have heard that it's, it's, it's very tough for certain guys, you know, yeah. when you get back, just kind of trusting it. Um, for me, that really wasn't my issue. You just issue. trust the doc. Yeah, I, well, not the doc. I just trust that I'm, I'm ready to go. Yeah. My trust is in God. And so I'm just like, look, I'm, I'm healed. They say I'm cleared. I'm ready to rock. And I just kind of put one foot in front of the other. And once you get that, uh, like the, the training wheels, once you get like, okay, I jumped, I fell, and nothing happened, you kind of just forget about it. But I do know that for some, for some people, it is very difficult to get back on the court after a, you know, a big injury like that. So the thing that kind of put you on the map during COVID and, and all of the, the BLM stuff and mm-hmm. all that, uh, you stood for the uh, national anthem, which was not that popular 
at the time. At all. Uh, <laughs> when, when you look back on that, do you think it was like, uh, well, I have no doubt that you, you're, you're proud of what you did. Mm. But does it seem like a crazy time to look back on that, the bubble with the NBA, just the, the whole situation? Insane. Um, it's, it's weird, like, because now, like, kind of the dust has settled. Um, you know, things have come out about BLM and the organization, the way that they handle funds and stuff like that. So it's just like, it doesn't, it's not as, as kind of potent right now. But when you go back in time, like even COVID stuff, it's, yeah. it's died down. People aren't as emotional about it. But in the heat of it, it was like, <laughs> it was like Armageddon. It was, it was, it was, it was real. Um, so to be in that moment of deciding on what I was going to do, how I was going to handle the pressure of the moment, uh, it really was, it really, 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 really was tough. So then you, you do that and then kind of you get welcomed by like a whole bunch of people that maybe politically you probably thought maybe either weren't your people or it was just like a community of people. You published your book with the Daily Wire, right? Mm -hmm. Like these were probably not things you would have expected. Can you talk about like what it was like to kind of go in that direction, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, so after I got, after I decided to stand in the bubble um, and go through that entire process, there was a- were, were you literally the only player that did? No, one of the players did, I believe, My Miles, Myers Leonard. Uh -huh. um, he did, I, be I believe. Yeah. Oh, and he he's not a, even in the league anymore, No, right? he's not in the league anymore. That, that's interesting. There was some other stuff there, but like, yes. he's young enough and, and skilled enough. To right, no, he, I'm, I'm pretty sure he can definitely play. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so there was a ton of, you know, negativity around the stand. Obviously, people were upset um, about me deciding to stand and not kneel. Um, but then you talked about the, there was an overwhelming support, um, obviously, of Christians, people who understood you know, the heartbeat of why I decided to stand in the first place. Um, I did, I never felt comfortable with the tone and the rhetoric of the Black Lives Matter organization, and I didn't want to co-sign their message by putting on their t-shirt. Um, and also I, I didn't want to co-sign, you know, their message by kneeling. And so there was that kind of, you know, conservative folks that uh, obviously see this kind of person standing up for the flag and yeah. uh, they kind of latched onto it. But I, I tried my best to stay true to my message of, I believe that, if we decide, all of us, white, black, and different, choose to love each other like God loves us, which is in spite of our sin, in spite of our shortcomings, and realizing that we all fall short of God's glory, we could have real progress and change. And so that's what I stuck to. But I, I, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't negative towards that kind of attention. Yeah. Um, they definitely welcomed me with open arms, and being able to publish a book with the Daily Wire, I started to learn about these people and and. And, you know, they show me love. They show me love. So they're and, not a bunch of crazy racists? No, that's, 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 that's not what I got from it. And, <laughs> you know, I would get questions about, like, you know, why would you publish your book with the Daily Wire? Yeah. They're all racist. And I'm like, well, you know, why would they publish my book? You know, I, I, obviously there is, there's an ideological um, similarity that trumps skin color mm -hmm. um, in their eyes. Or they wouldn't publish my book. It would be like, okay, we might agree with him on some things, but he's black. <laughs> you know, right, we're not gonna do right, it. Right. So obviously that trumped the color of my skin. And and even with Ben Shapiro being, you know, you know, an Orthodox Jew and me being a Christian, um, still decided to publish my book. And my book is like all about Jesus at the end of the day. And you're six eleven, and he's like four two. Yes. So that there's a huge discrepancy. Yeah, it's very intimidating. <laughs> and so, uh, so yeah, so no, it was, it was a great process. Um, very tough. Like I said, you know, there was. There was one moment, and you know, I try my best to spell it, this all out in the book, but I was on the phone with my pastor the night before I decided to stand, and I'm telling him, like, I don't think you understand how crazy this is gonna be. I hadn't signed my contract yet. I was up for an extension that, that summer. Um, I knew I was gonna be name called. I knew I was gonna be ridiculed for it. And he said to me, you cannot stand for God and God not stand for you. And so that mm -hmm. was kind of like the mic drop moment. I was like, all right, I'm doing it. And we went full, you know, full speed ahead. Yeah, and it's basically uh, it's basically worked since then. You're doing a lot of stuff, including yeah. including you got a new three month old in your life too. Yes, um, even talking about doing stuff, I never in a million years would have thought that I'd be an author. So even when I get introduced like that, Jonathan Isaac, the author, <laughs> NBA player, I'm like, what? That still doesn't make any sense to me. But to be an author, to have that come out of um, this moment of standing, it, it is really surreal. And now I got a baby girl. Yeah, uh, three months How, old. How's fatherhood treating you? <sighs> I love it. It's, it's like, you know, there's not many words for it or to try to put it into its right perspective, but it is that unconditional love for something that, that you know, you're responsible for. And so it's been, it's been, it's been amazing. Yeah. So all of this stuff happens. Uh, you get some of the pushback. Now seeing some of the dust settle, the guys come up to you now and they're like, hey, you know, maybe I should have done that or I respect what you did or is there any of that kind of stuff or is everyone? Yeah, yeah I've, I've, yeah. Had, I've had plenty of conversations. Um, not just for the BMM stuff, but 
I, I would say even more so for the COVID for the, stuff. Right, that, yeah, yeah, um, that was the next one. So it, it is something that people forget, but like even that moment was like, I'm the only player on my team and one of a handful of guys in the NBA that decided not to get vaccinated. And so that was... We'll, we'll throw to a video of that right here so okay. that people, people can see it again. Um, I'm, I'm not anti-vax. I'm not anti-medicine. I'm not anti-science. Uh, I didn't come to my current vaccination status by studying black history or watching Donald Trump press conferences. I have nothing but the utmost respect for every healthcare um, worker and person in Orlando and all across the world that have worked tirelessly to keep us safe. Um, my mom has worked in healthcare for a really long time. Um, I thank God I'm grateful that I live in a society where vaccines are possible and we can uh, uh, protect ourselves and have the means to protect ourselves for the first in the first place. Um, but with that being said, it is my belief that the, the vaccine status of every person should be their own choice um, and completely up to them without the without bullying, without being pressured or without being forced into doing so. Uh, I'm not ashamed to say that I'm uncomfortable with taking the vaccine at this time. I think that we're all different. We all come from different places. We've all have had different experiences and hold dear to different beliefs. And uh, what it is that you do with your body when it comes to putting medicine in there uh, should be your choice. I'm free of the ridicule and the opinion of others. But was that completely on the fly for you? Or, I mean, I guess everyone was ask, being asked questions like that, but were you planning on that moment? So what happened, this is what happened. What happened was, not to take up too much time on this topic, no. but what happened was um, I had gone through the whole thing. I saw everything that was going out. You know, people were being crazy about COVID, um, all these weird things about why you should get a shot and incentivizing you to get a shot. I'm like, and then obviously you're getting bullied if you even have any questions about it, natural immunity, all that stuff. I'm like, you didn't want to do it for the free hamburger? I'm like, yo, like, <laughs> if you're trying to get somebody to do something, threatening them, is, it's only going to make them more weary. I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but I decided not to do it. Um, and then Rolling Stone put out an article. Uh, it was something like NBA's anti-vaxxer problem and they're pushing around the league and all that stuff. And I had a call with a journalist and... It was all good faith. Oh, you know, Jonathan, you know, would love to get your story, all this stuff. And I'm telling him about, you know, why my decision not to get vaccinated. Yeah. And then the article comes out and it's like Jonathan Isaac waited for people to die. He put his trust in God, all this different stuff. I'm like, this is terrible. And I was furious because this, this is the first time that I had saw that there there is a media bias and a, uh, you know, people call it propaganda. People call it um you know, they, if they want something to go in a certain way, they have the power and the tools to do so. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to their discretion. And so that was my first instance of being like, they're right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people are telling the truth about all this stuff. And so... Uh, Once you see that, isn't it freaky? Cause, yes. Because no matter how you see it, no matter what yeah. leads you to that moment of seeing it, once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's freaky, but it's freeing too. Yeah. Because now I'm like, okay, it's like I had my moment of like, okay, I, I, I know what all this means. And so I was preparing myself um, because I had media day coming up literally the next day after the, the article dropped. So I knew I was going to get questions. People were tweeting me, telling me I'm crazy and stupid and all this stuff. And I'm an anti-vaxxer. And so, uh, I took that kind of that night to be like, okay, I, I know what it is that I stand for. I know why I did what I did and not taking it and kind of just prepare myself. And then I got the questions. Yeah. So you, the COVID thing, the BLM thing, the injury thing, mm -hmm. all of this stuff, fatherhood, then you get back on the court just for the end of the season. I mean, that, that's like a lot of stuff that you're, that you kind of, oh, you release a book? Yes. I mean, like yeah. a whole, and it's speaking gigs, that. all that stuff, uh, just to get you to, just to what you love and what your, your main gig is. It's, it's pretty amazing. I just, I mean, I just stayed busy. Like, you know, I was, I was rehabbing every day. I was putting in the work, um, but, you know, I had free time on my hands to, to do and to think and create and, you know, just try my best to be an inspiration to other people who also found themselves in this moment but didn't have either the courage or the the people around them to stand. And that's something that, it, it wasn't all me. I had people around me pushing me to to be a, a light to other people. And so that's that's why a lot of the stuff that I did, I decided to do it. Do you think you were proven right, not only on the COVID stuff, but even on a lot of the woke stuff? Uh, and then this will sort of get us to United yeah. in a sec, but like, you know, the NBA even has scaled back on the on the woke stuff. You know, they, they had the BLM logos on the on the court, basically. Mm -hmm. Those are gone. They seem like they've shifted out of it. Um, the, the NHL, for example, they're not going to do Pride Night anymore. Like, just these right. things that they push on everybody, it does seem like there's been some reversal of some of that. Yeah, a thousand percent. A thousand percent there is. Um, I think that uh, it's just when you get to these moments of hostility and 
everything is at the rise. It is very easy to jump on, you know, we want to support this and we want to push this. But when the dust does settle and kind of everybody kind of comes back to their senses and like, okay, what is going on? Where are things at? Um, I do think the the kind of rational thing to do is to scale back um, and kind of get back to program as usual. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people and companies have done. I'm guessing most of the players probably feel that way too privately, right? Like that they're just like, I just want to play ball. Like I think I think that's else. a lot I think yeah. even past players, I think that's just most Americans. Yeah. Um, especially when it comes to sports and entertainment, they do just want to enjoy. And I'm not saying that uh I'm not saying that the free choice for companies to voice their opinion on issues that they feel strongly about is wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's the great thing about America. People are free to do so. Um, but I do think that in sport and entertainment, there should be discretion and there should be nuance um, that the people that are watching are not all the same. They don't all believe the same things. And they should, you know, that should go into your messaging and what you decide to put out there and not demonizing one set of people or one group or one side. Um, but just you know, trying to share you know your view as a company and as a person, and I think at the same time, if the league is comfortable doing it, they should then be just as comfortable allowing their athletes to do it too, even if it's in a way that they don't agree with. Right, that seems to be the the part that the leagues never get on board with, right? The, the two way street portion of this mm -hmm. thing. No. So uh, you mentioned Naples. Now you play for Orlando, Florida guy. Uh, according to the to the media that you no longer trust, uh, I thought Florida is no good for black people. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what they tell us? I mean, I've I've, that... I've been okay here for <laughs> for, for a while, and uh, and you're not hiding. You're not hiding at six eleven. Yeah, no. I mean, look, it's just you know, no no place is perfect. Um, every place has their ups and their downs. But to espouse that you know, black people can't be in Florida, it is it is ridiculous. Um, and that's that kind of the nuance that people don't. You know, it's, everything is just so polarizing these days. You get, you get the hits and you get the the controversy and the likes by saying something extremely controversial, and then it goes everywhere. Oh, this one one side is saying, "Oh, I can't believe they said that," and the other yeah. side is trying to back what the person said. Um, but obviously, that's false with the amount of African Americans that live in Florida. You know what the number one state for black-owned small businesses is? Is it Florida? Well, there you go. It is Florida. There you go. So speaking of business. Uh, you're starting Unitas, mm -hmm. which now is going to be basically, well, you tell me, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I was going to say something. You tell me what it's going to be. So um, back in 2020, same yeah. kind of around that time of the BLM and the COVID, I was a Nike signed athlete and paid by Nike, signed by Nike. Um, and after I got injured, I ended up. How does, how does that process go, by the way, when they're when you're drafted, they're bringing you in? Do all the shoe companies come up to you and everybody's trying to figure out who to go to who? Or you yeah, go to it, them? Well, it, or? it depends largely on. Um, who you were as a college athlete as well. And so I've worn Nike kind of my whole life once I got into basketball. So I was on, I was in the EYBL, which is Nike's kind of youth AAU circuit. Yep. So I was, always wearing, I was always wearing Nike then, loved it. Um, when I got to Florida State, Florida State's a Nike school, um, got to the league, uh, well, we're transitioning into the league. I was courted by Adidas um, for a while, but no other companies. I was kind of adamant about, you know, I want to be a Nike guy. And um, ended up signing with them, and it was it, it was great. Like I, I love Nike, um, and I have lo loved Nike for a long time. I disagree um, with them, and a lot of other companies have kind of made conscious decisions over the last few years to move in a in a specific direction. This is what they're saying that they're for. Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to Unitas, it's, for me, it's just about freedom. It's just about look. These companies are allowed to do it, just like I talked about the organizations like the NBA. But we're also free to support what we want to support. And if I could create something that stands up for family, faith, freedom, um, and the values and ideals that one has made this country great, um, has made this country prosper, prosper and have the progress that it has had from its founding, um, and then just stay true to who I am as a, as a Christian man and athlete and, and person, uh, I want those values to be celebrated in the marketplace and in the culture. And what better, what, what better way to do that than through really cool Awesome clothing. Yeah, so it's an athletic wear brand that Athle we'll, athletic wear and leisure wear and leisure wear. So we'll show some images while, yeah. while we're talking right now. How does this even begin? How does this happen? That like yeah, so question. one day did you have the idea and then you go to somebody? Did somebody no, come no, no. to you? I, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. So um, my pastor is a huge part of my life. Um, you know, I was like I told you, I was on the phone with him the night before I decided to stand in the bubble. But um, just talking to him. And he, he was the reason why I wrote the book as well. He comes rushing over to my house one day and says, people know your stand, but they don't know your story. 
And that was the thing of saying, you need to write a book and you need to do a movie, all this different yeah. stuff. Uh, <laughs> Is the movie coming? The, we've, been, it, we've been in talks for quite a while. Wow. But if anybody wants to do the Why I Stand movie, hit me up. All right. But, all right. Uh, but yeah, so uh, after I didn't resign with Nike, um, talking to him, he says, you know, you should, you should look into creating your own shoe, you know, something that, you know, stands for your values and that you can use for you. It wasn't necessarily something that could be, you know, broadcasted to everybody. Um, and I said, you know, I don't think you understand how hard it is to create a shoe. Like, this isn't, this isn't easy. <laughs> yeah, and I've yeah. learned how difficult it is to create a high, you know, high value, high performance yeah. shoe. Um, but to his guidance, I kind of said, you know what, I'll set out and see what it looks like. Had some conversations and then was like, I'm going to do it. And uh, that vision of just creating a shoe for myself to wear during the season turned into there are so many people that believe like I believe. And as I see the decline of these values and ideals that I believe deserve to be celebrated, as I see their decline in the marketplace and culture, um, why not give these people uh, something for them? Give them a home, build a community of people that are saying, um, these, we love these values and we stand on these values. And I think too, with being the only person to do a couple of things, I do know how lonely it is to do something by yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I know that the fear aspect and the intimidation aspect of everything that's going on around you is very daunting. And so if I can help people have a sense of pride about their values and ideals um, and be able to wear it on their sleeve, I think that's something that's beautiful and, yeah. and American and, and free. And so uh, that vision started to kind of bounce around my head and uh, he came up with the name Unitas and we were just kind of like playing with it. And, and from there, we kind of, I've just been kind of executing the background, not saying anything to anybody. Yeah, yeah. So what do you do? Like, do you, was the first idea, okay, I'm going to create the shoe first. Yeah, the, the, and, the shoe started yeah. first. So I'm, I, I am going to be debuting a shoe at some point this summer that I yeah. will be wearing this upcoming season. It's called the Judah One. I'm going to be five colorways. Each colorway has a different verse, um, Bible verse that goes with the, the colorway in the shoe. Um, but that's just, that's, that's not necessarily Unitas just yet. Um, one of the things about Unitas is I want to be able to sign athletes from mm -hmm. all different sports as we grow um, value aligned athletes to be, you know, ambassadors and forerunners for the company and brand. I'm going to be the first signed athlete to the company. And so that sneaker is going to fall under Judah that is signed to Unitas. And so um, it started there. And then it looked like, okay, what and is And were it? you there, like, at the factory, like, to, telling them this is what I want? I want this weight. I want... I'll tell you like, this. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a company called Soulworks. Um, there are ex-Nike guys, ex-Adidas guys that have kind of come together and said, you know, we want to do one-off shoes for certain people. So they're huh. doing they're doing Marshawn Lynch's cleat. They're doing, you know, I think they did a shoe for Pharrell or something like that as well. And so I got hooked up with them and I said, you know, I don't know anything about this field or this industry. And they did. So we kind of linked up and were able to come into some type of partnership and the shoes being made out of Vietnam. And so they've been, you know, going back and forth and sending me videos and photos and the design process took forever. Um, but it took a, you know pretty much an entire year um, to be able to get a, this is what we want the shoe to look like, this is what we want it to, to, to feel like, to have the prototypes, all that stuff, and now we're here. Right, right. Are you involved in making sure that the process yeah. being made in Vietnam, all that stuff, you know, obviously is, Nike gets a lot of flack for some of their practices, like how involved a, are you a in that A thousand percent. They, they, yeah. they, they've assured me, they've gone back and forth that this is an upstanding factory. I was very adamant about um, not desiring to manufacture in China and trying to find, you know, sourcing otherwise, and mm -hmm. we were able to, so I'm happy yeah. about that. That must have been complex, because I feel like everything's made out of China. Everything is made out of China, but um, for clothing and stuff, there's, there's great factories in Turkey, and a lot of the embroidering and stitching is done right here in America. Yeah, so, okay, so you launch with the shoe, and then over the fall, then a bunch of the other products so will come out? So on August 1st, people yeah. will be able to buy leisure wear, yeah. and so that's gonna be T-shirts, hoodies, sweatpants, um, jackets, stuff like that. And then as we move through the fall, there's going to be a, a sportswear drop for men and women. There's also kids that's going to be available in the leisure wear as well. And as we get closer to the season, we'll drop the sneaker. And then, you know, the hope is that we'll be able to build on this and, you know, training shoes, running shoes, walk around shoes, everything like that, and kind of off into the sunset. Do you view your, your basketball career in some way as just the vehicle that then became the thing to do all of this other stuff? I mean, not only the company but mm -hmm. spiritual stuff and everything else i would say to a degree um i love basketball um i love playing it i love i love the game ever since i was a kid um but i, I it, it has become what i do and not who i am mm. um 
I found my identity in Christ and I just try my best to use that as a platform for who I am and uh, love the game. I can't wait to get back to it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to have a great season. I'm looking forward to it. But again, I, I, I try to use it as a vehicle to, to portray, you know, who I am as an individual over, you know, basketball being the end all be all to, down, to Jonathan Isaac. Do you get any pushback on the controversial stuff Do anymore? Because sometimes I find people after you've been through it enough and yeah. you've hit you've hit big ones, right? Yeah, COVID yeah, yeah. flag, like America, all, like you've hit not just minor ones, like big ones. But sometimes you get to the other side and then there's a certain type of person just completely moves on and another type of person kind of stays in, the, in that craziness for a while. Well, I definitely still get it. Um, I think that my skin has gotten a bit thicker um, where it's just like, yo, like, I know who I am and, you know, I'm going to let you know who I am and what it is that I believe in and you're free to like that or not, but I'm going to be authentic to myself. And so uh, I definitely still get pushed back. I definitely like, you know, I can't, I can't tweet something without getting a tweet back <laughs> about, about <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. what somebody thinks about me, which is fine. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I'm definitely, you know, going through the course and kind of going through the ringer of what does it look like to be attacked and have your name kind of drug through the mud. Um, and it does make you a stronger, more resilient person. You know, I'm just thinking of this on the fly, but you know, another guy who has said a lot of controversial things, another one that's no longer in the league is Enos Cantor, yeah. who certainly, skill-wise, guy was averaging a double-double, mm. I think his last season. I mean, he should be in the league, so that must have been sitting with you for a lot of this too, right? Well, yeah. I, I Even with, you know, back during BLM, I told you I hadn't signed my contract yet, so I already knew that this could be something that, you know, derails that yeah. because of, you know, you, you never know about, you know, possibility of being blackballed from the NBA, um, that there's a chance of that happening. Um, or, you know, your organization or somebody head up that, high up that you don't even know says, you know, we don't want that guy on our team anymore. Um, I'm sure it has happened behind closed doors and we don't know about it. But, uh, you know, even possibly in that, in that in this situation, you don't know what transpired for him not to be in the league anymore. But um, it was definitely a thought in the back of my mind that this could be the end of my career but just kind of piggybacking on what you know, my pastor told me, you can't stand for God and God not stand for you. I stood, I was able to sign my contract and you know, keep moving forward with the magic. Yeah, so you must have a real love for the Orlando organization, I would imagine. I, I, I've, got, I've got major respect. Because most, most wouldn't have. I mean, I've, I think that's pretty no, obvious. I've, I've, I've got major respect. Um, you know, I was their first draft pick, the new uh, John Hammond and Jeff Weltman, I was their first pick. And so they've done right by me, they show me love. Um, even through all the controversial stuff. And so I definitely have a great respect for him. Yeah. What else is next? Well, I guess the movie's next. That's, you're, working <laughs> I'm, on, you're working on the movie. I feel like we're going to do this every year, and every yeah, year right. we have next? another, major, another um, major project. What's next is just, you know, having a great season and seeing, um, seeing Unitas take off, um, you know, hoping that people obviously love what it looks like. That's a huge thing. I wanted yep. it to be something that's culturally relevant and that young people, adults, kids, they want to wear it. Obviously, that's great. Um, but even more so, I want to see the message of believing and finding pride and encouragement in our values. I want to see that propagated. I want to see that grow. Um, through ever what vehicle that is, I believe that Unitas is a vehicle that, that can stand the test of time and have people feel that way about the brand and the company. And that's all I'm looking for. Do you have certain athletes in, in different sports that you're talking to or you kind of have your eye on them? I've, like, oh, I've, that's I've, the type of guy I could yeah, talk I've, to? Or? I've got a few. Yeah. I've, had, I've had some great conversations with different guys. I won't name them. Yep. Um, I think by the time this comes out, people will already know. But uh, Riley Gaines is going to be our, our kind oh. of first brand ambassador. Awesome. So she'll be at the yeah. event as well. Um, she's not swimming anymore, but she's a, <clears throat> she's a, she's a firehouse um, for what she's stood for and been able to do in women's sports. And looking forward to seeing her kind of career in speaking and everything like that take off. And so she's awesome. Yeah. It never stops. They, they'll always find another one for you, right? Like there's just always another controversy and another guy that'll hopefully do the right thing. Yes. Yeah. How involved are you in not just the shoes, which you talked about, but all the, the clothing, athletic wear, et cetera, in terms of design and all that? Like to, to I'm super involved. It, to keep it as yeah, I'm, as I'm, I'm I'm super involved. Yeah. Um, it's definitely something that I try to get knock out of my in my free time. Yeah. Um, meetings and calls and stuff like that. But I'm 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 healthily involved to where I can still do what I gotta do, but also steer this thing in a way that sticks to the vision that I set out for it to be.
I don't say this to many guests, but you're basically living my dream. You're, you're in the NBA and you're doing a zillion other things. I know you love the hoops, so love, I appreciate that. That you love. All right, next time next time we're doing this at my house so we can okay. get that one-on-one game going. Okay. But right, again, cool. I got the... I'll wait, take it. Wait, take, how old are you? How old I'll are take you? I'll take you 25. 20, so I'm, I'm 47, so you got 22 years on me. You got about a foot and a half mm-hmm. and, and you got two good knees. It's not really fair. You won't score. Can you... You play NBA Live? Could we try that maybe? No, actually, I'm actually not very good at that stuff. <laughs> but I, you'll probably beat me in that for sure. If I could get an H on you, that would be enough. Okay. A hor- no, ho- horse, you're probably good at horse stuff. I can shoot. I can shoot stuff. Okay. That's well, the last thing to go. You know yeah, right. I mean? We'll see. We'll see then. <laughs> it's good seeing you, my friend. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate you. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of mindless drivel, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.